I, I'm so delighted to introduce Anna Ball. So Anna is the third generation CEO of the 117 year old Ball Horticultural Company, which specializes in all aspects of horticulture, including breeding, biotechnology, production and marketing of hybrid flower seeds and other floricultural crops. Privately held and now in its fourth generation of family management, Ball Horticultural Company is located in over 20 locations worldwide. They have a vast and very diverse array of partners and companies under their umbrella, which you'll hear about, uh, but including the familiar burpee plants, Darwin perennials, and wave petunias. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado and her MBA from Northwestern University. Anna was also one of the inaugural co-chairs of NGC's collaborator, Seed Your Future, uh, the movement dedicated to promoting horticulture and inspiring more people to pursue careers working with plants. Since 1988, she has been a trustee for one of my favorite places in the world, the Martin Arboretum. In her free time, Anna plays the ukulele, and she is an avid cook. So please join me in welcoming uh -huh. Anna Ball. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Susan. That was, uh, that was uh, very nice of you. And uh, I've known Susan for uh, many years now, and uh, she's just terrific for our industry. So thank you. That, that, that was really nice. Well, I just wanted to start by saying, uh, I was mentioning to uh, the group before that uh, many years ago, I gave a talk uh, at your, one of your national conventions, I think it was in Kentucky, and it was a huge room with tons of people in it, and all of you guys were in it, and uh, your group was in it, and it was, I remember it as, and I always tell people, it was the best audience I ever had. The audience was super engaged and just shouting out questions during the talk, and we just had a thing going, even when there were so many people in the room, it was so nice. So I wish I could be with you personally all now, but uh, I guess this is the second best thing. So actually that's the reason I, I was delighted to accept this invitation because of that wonderful experience I had with all of you. So it's thrill I'm thrilled to be back. So uh, I'm gonna um, share my screen here and walk you through some things. I was asked to talk a little bit about the history of our company and a few other things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start that now and uh, Go through the um, go through the screen. So I will share screen. Correct. Can everybody see that? We can. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. So as uh, Susan mentioned, um, we are the Ball Horticultural Company, and uh, we are in the fourth generation now. We're one of the few family businesses left in uh, in the industry in terms of being a seed company, a sort of a global seed company. Um, and we're very determined to keep the family ownership. So that's something that we're working on. It's not easy, but uh, we're, we're determined to do that. So that's uh, something we're working on. So we are in the fourth generation, as she mentioned. Um, and uh, the, my daughter's now involved in the business. So she's the fourth generation. So that's pretty cool. And uh, Susan also mentioned a couple of our brands. We don't sell to the consumer. We're, we, we're, we do stuff on the back end, which I'll explain. But these are some of the brands that do get to retail that you might know about. The Knockout is probably our biggest, the Knockout Roses and the Wave Petunias. And uh, also some of the oldest are our tomato varieties, Early Girl, Better Boy, um, those kinds of all tomatoes uh, are from us as well in the past. So those are some of our brands. So I always like to think of the uh, history in terms of the people. And of course, my grandfather was the founder of the company and he was an unusual guy, as you can imagine. Um, he left home when he was 14 years old. He, he hated his stepmother, changed his name and left. And so he didn't really get much of an education. However, he was self-taught, that's him over on the far left. And he had a quite an experience for two years in the Spanish American War in the Philippines and Cuba. He kept a journal for 50 years, every, writing every day. And his journal uh, entries for this time in the Philippines particularly is just uh, harrowing, it's just unbelievable. But when he came back, he went to work for uh, growers in different greenhouses and he uh, became a grower himself. So he was really two things, he was a grower uh, he would grow cut flowers for the Chicago market, put them on the train and ship them down there. 
And then he was also a writer and he was all self-taught. Um, he wrote books and he wrote uh, articles uh, and that writing uh, really runs in the family. Uh, uh, many of us are, are kind of love to write. So in that time, really from the early 1900s until the World War II, there really was only cut flowers. Uh, if you think in terms of products, I mean, the bedding plant industry really didn't exist and the pot plant industry really didn't exist as industry. So it was all cut flowers, asters, uh, uh, chrysanthemums, sweet peas was a huge one, uh, those kinds of products. He had a very strong wife and it's interesting because he was born in Cincinnati, was not um, educated formally, but he married a woman from, who was born in Germany, came over here when she was a teenager and she went to four years of college and got a degree, which was very unusual for women back then. So she was a big helper to him in the business and she was who I was named after. Her name was Anna uh, as well. They had five kids. That's my dad over on the far right. He was kind of an afterthought, but he, he turned out to be the one that uh, kind of took over. So um, uh, also another thing that my grandfather kind of did besides a writing, passed down his writing ability was his love of travel. And I think if anything, that's one of the reasons we've been successful as a company. He traveled in the 20s and 30s to seedsmen in uh, Germany and in Japan and establish relationships with companies that we actually still sell to today. It's incredible. And flower seed is small and you can put it in your pocket and travel all over the world. And that's really what he did. And that, that's a reason that we became, I think, such a, such a strong company. Then my dad took over and he did a lot in terms of, he also was a huge traveler. And he did a lot, of, especially in terms of Europe. Uh, that's him in the middle there. and. Um, he, he opened up a lot of, because uh, Europe was kind of the thing then, and he opened up a lot of supplies and, and things from Europe. He was also very much um, prone to getting outside help. That's Peter Drucker on the right and Francis Hesselbein on the left. He would always go and try to get, he was a huge reader as, as my grandfather was and as I am too, and he would always try to get outside help. So that was another thing that he brought in. We have an outside board and that's something that that has also been a huge influence on our success as a company. He also had a strong wife who helped him in the business. That's my mother on the right. And uh, she was a huge influence in the company, a, quite a larger than life character. Uh, and the employees just adored her. So she was a big, big help to him. They would talk things through uh, every night. So it was a big help. And then I took over in 1995 when my dad wanted to go off and do education reform, um, which he did. And I worked a lot more in Asia and really expanded our, uh, our reach into Japan, Korea, Australia, and China. So I kind of did the more of the Asian, uh, Asian growth. <clears throat> I also established what we know as the Armada. <laughs> this is a weird picture, but we think of our, we're, we're a completely de decentralized company. We're organized, decentralized. In other words, all of our companies and all of our locations around the world uh, run their own show with a captain of each ship. Uh, we're not centralized like uh, our competitors are and like many companies are. Uh, it's not better or worse, it's just very different. So we run what we call an armada and we talk a lot about our armada. We're all going in the same direction, but each boat has a captain. So that's our philosophy about how we're organized. These are our global locations. Different colors represent different things, which I'll explain in a minute. <clears throat> and each one of these has their own captain and their own ship. So um, what, sometimes people ask why, how we've been successful. And that's one of the things I was asked to, to, to touch on. And I always say uh, we're successful ma mainly because of luck, <laughs> uh, hard work and humility. Those are the three things I always think about. And when you think about luck, um, I think, uh, I, I always think of something which I, I, when I learned it, I was aghast, but uh, maybe you guys know it. But when I was born, the two thirds of the world population, two thirds of everybody in the world was hungry. They were in extreme poverty. Today, that number is less than 9%. And 
That to me is astounding. And that to me is one of the reasons that we have been able to grow as a company. Because if you're hungry, you don't buy flowers, right? Uh, but because of the economic growth in the world and the, and the, and the plummeting poverty rate, um, we have been able to grow as a company because when a, when a country, I always said, when a country gets their first McDonald's, then we can go in and start, start, uh, start the flower industry, which is kind of what we've done. And so when people have education and they're not hungry anymore, they can get an education, they can start thinking about how to better their lives and they can get, um, and, and flowers are a big part of that. Not only personal flowers, but flowers that, that countries plant in their cities to, to uh, help the, the cities. So that's part of the luck. This is a supply chain that, uh, that kind of shows how, how the industry works, right? We start out on the on the top there with breeding, and then when when we or other companies uh, come up with new varieties, when we breed new varieties, we have to figure out how to uh, produce them. That's the seed and cutting production, and then we distribute those seeds and cuttings in the U.S. to plant producers, um, and then distribute them to the finished plant production, who sells it to the retailer, who sells it to the consumer. So this is a supply chain. This is how you get your product. If you go buy your flowers in the springtime, this is how you get, get it. And what we do is everything in the, red, in the red there. So we don't grow the finished product and we don't sell directly to the retailer or to the consumer. So we're behind the scenes and everything, so to speak. So what I thought I'd do is run through very quickly the, the journey of one plant. And that kind of shows you how the, not only us, but the industry comes up with with new material. Many of you may remember 12, I think it was 12 years ago or so when Impatience died. <laughs> uh, I'm sure many of you remember that. It was amazing, huh? And in, in two years, uh, Impatience all over the world and all everywhere where they were grown, which is just about everywhere, uh, they died like in two years uh, from Impatience Downy Mildew. And there were diff different strains and different races in different countries and we were following it and we were experiencing it and we were devastated by it. Um, and it was a horrible thing because the consumer loves impatience because, um, because they're so wonderful, particularly for the shade, as you know. And also the um, grower can, can it, it's a wonderful crop for the grower because it's fast uh, and easy. And, uh, and, and it was a major, major product for us. So we had to come up with something that didn't uh, get, that was resistant to this, right? Or, or we'll just lose impatience forever. So on the right, you see impatience uh, that, are, that died. Maybe some of you may have had those in your yard um, as I did. And then on the left is, is our new variety. So that's what happens when you have impatience down in mildew. So first you have to start with breeding you have to say, okay, we have to come up with a new variety. How do we come up with that new variety? So we breed for a lot of different things. And this time we had to breed for a resistance to disease resistance. So we put our breeders on it. These are our wonderful uh, breeders that breed only flowers all over the world. And we have to breed in different locations because of the climate and because of um, uh, different diseases are different in different countries. So you have to breed in Asia for Asia, you have to breed in, in Europe for Europe. So these are the breeders and many of them were involved in this project. It was a huge project for us. And then we also have to, to support the breeders, we have a lab, a new lab here in West Chicago called Ball Helix that really does a lot of the laboratory work like um, molecular uh, biology, cell biology, pathology, tissue culture, uh, all the things that are that a lot of people don't understand <laughs> um, that really support the breeders and make them so they're able to breed quicker because things take such a long time to breed. Uh, and we need to, to quicken that, particularly in this case, we needed to, to, to speed it up. So, um, an example is molecular markers where you can take, you can, you can look at the plant and you can, uh, sometimes there's a marker that goes along with a specific disease. So instead of growing out a bunch of plants and trying to see if it's, 
if it uh, has the disease and then you have to inoculate it and then you have to wait to see if it dies, that just takes forever. Sometimes you can use molecular markers and then the lab can tell the breeder, hey, this, this cross does have the disease resistance, this doesn't, so you don't have to grow them, grow them out. That can save years uh, in a breeding situation like this one. Then after you come up with a bunch of different crosses that you think might work, you have to trial them. And this is something that people don't, it's kind of invisible, but it's a huge part of the process. <clears throat> this was taken almost hundred years ago uh, here. And it struck me because pretty much today, it looks exactly the same for breeder trials, right? You just grow out these things in a row and you look at them and you evaluate them. You have to do this all over the world in all different climates. And you have to do it for several years because you have to see how it's gonna do in different conditions, different types of summers, different types of winters, whatever the crop is. So trialing is something that's very expensive, takes a long time, and is a big part of the introduction process. Then you come up with a few varieties. You think, okay, these might work. These are resistant. Uh, they, they've lasted a few years in the, in the trials. They look good in all different countries, but maybe, you can't produce any seed or cuttings of it. So just because it's a great variety doesn't mean it'll get to market because a lot of times great varieties just don't want to produce seed for some reason. And uh, so we have to trial it and do seed production trials. We produce seed and in many different locations in nine different countries, um, all in the greenhouse. We produce 13 billion seeds a year, which is a number I didn't even know until I <laughs> researched this. And uh, 260 different crops and 2,400 different individual varieties. This is a highly technical process. And uh, it, it really varies with all different things. So we had to test this variety <coughs> and see if it would uh, produce, and it did. <coughs> Sorry, these are the countries where we produce seed. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very proud of the countries that we were, we're in these countries. We're also in many other countries where we produce vegetative cuttings, which is a whole different uh, thing. And um, we're very proud of our work in these countries because we usually go to pretty rural areas that uh, where there's not a lot of employment. We provide employment and, and careers for people who could never have had them. Uh, we provide health care. We provide a lot. And actually in some of our some countries, towns have actually grown up around it, and we've really raised the standard of living in, in these areas. So uh, to me, if you, if you can produce in some of these countries and provide employment, it's, it's really much better than aid because uh, it gives them, uh, a, gives them skills that they can take and use. So uh, we love our uh, places that we produce in. Then when you finally figured out if you can produce it, of course you have to market it. And that's, um, that's not, again, not as easy as you think because you have to figure out who you're gonna sell it to, what price you're gonna sell it, how are you gonna market it? And that's a, that's a big job in, it, in, it, in itself, of course. So we sell to many different people in the US. We sell to grower retailers. We have 10,000 customers in the US. So that's 10,000 growers who grow in a greenhouse products, whether it's uh, bedding plants, pot plants, um, perennials, annuals, vegetables, cut flowers, whatever. And many of you know grower retailers. So this is the grower who we sell to. He grows and then he sells out his front door. But we also have mega growers. This is one in North Carolina. Uh, they were just visiting here this week, actually. And this is interesting because what they told me this week, they were here on Monday, is this is the largest single story, story structure in North America, maybe in the world. And I had to think about that for a minute. What does that mean? <laughs> so single story, largest in the world is a huge greenhouse. It's a mega grower greenhouse. It is incredible. It's like a factory and uh, you can't walk around it. You have to take a cart because it just would take you all day to walk around it. But uh, it's a very efficient uh, way of doing it. Many of these mega growers are, have Dutch heritage and um, really know, know how to grow. And they are very automated. And if any of you ever get a chance to visit some of these guys, I mean, this is a, this is a machine. I think uh, this company, Metrolina, has maybe 20 or 30 of these machines just going like 24 hours a day, picking up these, these cuttings 
and then planting them in, in, in soil. And if I were more efficient with technology, I would show you a video, but I'm always scared of videos. So uh, you'll have to use your imagination on that. And then they sell to garden centers, Home Depot, Lowe's and Walmart are the big three. Uh, and they control mass markers, we think control maybe 60% of the, uh, the bedding plant market, at least in the United States. So they're quite powerful. We work directly with them, um, even though we don't sell to them. So that's kind of the story of Beacon. This is, a, this is a, some of the people who, who worked on that and uh, it's doing very well out in the market. Um, this is a fun truck that one of our other customers uh, down in, uh, based in Maryland and sells to Home Depot. So that's an example of something that we bred for a disease resistance, but we also do other things, obviously breed for other, other um, things. And I thought you'd be interested maybe in some of those like unique colors, that's the thing everybody thinks about, right? Everybody thinks, oh, when are you gonna have a yellow geranium or when are you gonna have a, uh, you know, something that's uh, really, really dif different. And these are some examples of the, like the, uh, red begonia or the Jurassic begonia in the upper left. It's kind of this really cool. I love, I love that product. It was bred by this guy that we work with out in Oregon. The upper right is the uh, Canova red golden flame, which this year in our gardens was my favorite variety, uh, which our breeders were not real happy with because we did not breed it. It was bred by Taki uh, in Japan, but that's okay. We, we sell the best varieties no matter who they come from. Um, in the lower left is bee's knees, which we did breed, which is the first real, real yellow petunia. And then the red lark, which was, I believe, came out number one with the poll that we did uh, with the, the visitors to our gardens this summer. Uh, it's not really red, but it's as close as anybody's gotten. So colors are something that, that we breed for, which is um, very visible. We also breed a lot for habit, okay? You guys know all about the habit of different plants. This is a huge thing. So in the upper left is, is one of the first, or I think it's the first uh, hanging basket type of pepper. So you can actually grow this like on your balcony in a hanging basket and, and it goes down and, and, uh, and has a hanging basket form. On the upper right is um, a new, Begonia that's mainly for the metropolitan areas like downtown Chicago type of places uh, that uh, use begonias a lot. And this has a real hanging basket. I've got this in my yard this year. It's really cool looking. Uh, and then in the lower left is a, just a, another type of shape, right? Upright um, emerald towers. I think people who grow, especially in, in uh, commercial settings would use that. And then the kitchen minis on the lower right is an example of a very dwarf, uh, with a very dwarf habit that you can grow um, in your kitchen, a little tomato there. And then production, we also have to think a lot about the grower because uh, even though it might be a wonderful product that does a great job for you in the greenhouse, I mean, in, the, in your yard, it might not be able to be produced efficiently in a greenhouse. So we have to think both of the consumer and the grower, which is always a big tension, right? Um, and, but it has to do well for both, otherwise you'll never see it. So in the upper left is a, is a one of a, a sure shot uh, series that all the petunias come in to bloom at the same time for the grower. So he can go in and clean out a greenhouse and ship it at the same time, which is very important for him. It's also a cool consumer thing, blueberries and cream. It's got a great name, great marketing. I love that petunia. In the upper uh, right is, a, is, a, is one of the first uh, echinacea from seed. Usually it's from tissue culture. Growers like to work with seeds, so that's a grower trait. Uh, in the lower left, that's a, uh, a grower trait that comes in, um, it comes in more uniform, the, the primavera. And in the lower right is the earliest rudbeckia to bloom for a grower uh, of any, and that's the gold blitz. So those are more sort of what we do, uh, again, behind the scenes for the grower, uh, so he can produce it easily and efficiently. So a couple of trends uh, in the industry. I, I've got a, we've got a whole like 20 different trends in the industry, but I picked out two or three that I thought were more uh, ones that you might be interested in. And these, these are some that, um, that uh, maybe more apply more to the, to the consumer. And one of them is just plants with personality, which has been something that we've been talking about for a long time. People don't want little soldiers anymore uh, in their yards. Uh, they want plants with personality. And um, by the way, this picture, 
of this guy. I've always wanted, I don't know where this came from. I've had it forever with that huge fiddle leaf fig with this interesting looking guy. It looks like it might be Italy or something. I've always wanted to track him down. I think he would be really cool. But anyway, that's a plant with definite personality. This is from my yard. About 10 years ago, I had a broodmansia in my yard and it bloomed like crazy. And then it would go out of bloom and then it would come back again. And I've never been able to find one since that does the same thing. But talk about personality. That's just like super cool. I mean, I just, I just still dream about that broodmansia. <laughs> These are some uh, uh, lupins, believe it or not, at Home Depot. And that's, I mean, I'm sure those sold out in like five seconds. The problem with these plants for personalities, they're not easy for growers to grow. And you see those carts in the back, everything for the grower is how many will fit on a cart. And these uh, lupins, obviously they couldn't get many on a cart. So that really affects their, their, um, their financial, uh, their finances when they can't get many on a cart. So the plants with personality is a great consumer wish, but it doesn't, the grower doesn't want plants with personality uh, in, in the sense of they're not good for shipping and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> this is one of our customers in Missouri. <coughs> I love that mom. They do this every year. And then you all heard about plant parents, of course. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about this trend is it really went crazy during COVID. Um, the whole, uh, the whole idea of houseplants uh, went crazy during COVID. Of course, it was in the 70s and now it came back uh, in, the, in, the, in, in COVID, which is, which is good. And I would really love to know if any of you want to tell me in the chat or whatever, if you think this trend is going to stay. So far it stayed, um, but we had 20 million, 20 million new gardeners come during COVID, 20 million in the U.S. alone. And the whole industry is asking ourselves, how many of those are going to stick around now that things are back to normal? Are they going to forget their plants and just go do other things or are they going to stick with their plants? So that's something that uh, I would love to hear from, from you on. Uh, this is the sill in New York. Maybe some of you have been there. Kind of is where the whole thing started uh, for sure. And uh, this is one of those influencers. Um, What's his name? Hilton Carter, I think. Um, many plant influencers. I mean, this is so cool for our industry, this kind of stuff. It's just great. So let me know if you think it's going to stay or not. And then the really big trend that we've been talking about for years, but again, it took a virus for the world to figure this out, which is super frustrating because we've been talking about it for so long. And the first time I th sort of thought of this was a long time ago, 10 or 15 years ago, when uh, a friend of mine who not in the industry came through when she was visiting, we had a new variety that I wanted her to see that was so pretty. And it was a new Gideon patient. And I went to the greenhouse and I said, look, Julie, look at this beautiful plant. Is that the prettiest color you've ever seen? And I was just like going on and on about how pretty it was. And she said to me, yeah, that's really pretty, but what else does it do? She actually said that. She said, what else does it do? And I was speechless and I'm never speechless. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. What do you mean, what else does it do? I couldn't even figure out what kind of question that was. But what she was really, uh, it was a premonition because what she was really um, talking about is what, what else do plants do? And of course, now we know plants do so many other things. But at that time, we weren't thinking about it. We were just thinking it was pretty. And I still think it's wonderful if a plant is just pretty, right? It can just be pretty. It doesn't have to do anything else. But of course, they do do everything else. And we know all about them now. This is from Charlie Hall from Texas A&M. You don't have to read it, but it just shows you that the power of plants to really affect quality of life is well documented. And these are, these are research studies that show that uh, plants do increase property values. Plants do increase... Um, uh, mental and physical well-being, which are the two things that really came out in the came out in COVID, right? Everybody was talking about that, and um, so it's wonderful what happened during COVID. Even though COVID wasn't that wonderful, but uh, the what happened to our industry? The whole industry was up thirty percent in twenty twenty. By the way, thirty percent, three zero, and ten percent last year. And now everybody's saying, what's going to happen this year? <laughs> and that's what we don't know. And I would love to hear 
from you. But of course, plant blindness persists, um, which we all know about plant blindness. So what else does it do? Shoppers spend more when their plants around. Uh, rental rates are higher. Occupancy rates are higher. This is all documented. It's good stuff. Office plants decrease sick time by 14% and office and that you get out a day earlier from, from a hospital stay if you uh, have plants in your room. This is, this is unbelievable stuff, right? And we have to keep talking about this in the industry. I mean, I'm speaking to, preaching to the choir here, but it's, it, it's uh, each of us talk about it. And of course, as Susan mentioned, I'm uh, very involved with our arboretum and trees are like the super plants. Uh, trees are just unbelievable what they do. So one thing I wanted, to, a couple more things I wanted to mention, and then we can go into the Q&A, is uh, one problem we have in the industry, and we, we found this out also when we were starting our, uh, we did a lot of focus groups in Seed Your Future, is, and of course, this is something that we know, our terminology really turns people off, a lot of people off. And we don't want to admit that because uh, we just don't want to admit that because we like our terminology, right? And even the word horticulture is, according to young people, weird. And we did a lot of focus groups with Seed Your Future, and we found out that virtually no teenager knows what horticulture means. And if their parents know what it means, all they know is, I don't want my kid to do that because it's just hot, and, and we don't want, I don't want my kid to be in that career. You're, all you do is just water plants and not make any money kind of thing. So people don't really understand horticulture at all. And the other thing is, I think this is an issue. It's kind of hard to say. It actually is kind of hard to say. So I think that's a problem. We have yet to come up with a different or better word, not that we have to, but maybe something to think about. And as somebody told me, uh, millennials don't come into the garden center looking for hemorrhagic fulva. They come into the garden center looking for something orange that they don't have to replant every year. And if we don't start speaking in their language, I think we've got a problem. My board has been telling me this for a long time because they're not from the industry. And they say, every time I go into a garden center, I get totally confused. And, uh, and uh, every time I read a gardening magazine, I get confused. And so... Uh, they're speaking uh, out of um, the ignorance that they have, which is uh, something we should think about. And then just to close, I just wanted to say that I live near Chicago and uh, we used to go in the city all the time when I was a kid. And I went back and found some old pictures of Chicago. This is Michigan Avenue, 1950. No plants, no plants. If you go and you Google Chicago, 1950s, you find tons of photographs. Occasionally there'll be a tree, um, probably not a very nice tree, but just a tree that happened to grow in spite of everything, but there are no plants. And Chicago today is just fantastic. And of course, many other cities are as well, but I think Chicago is the best of them. And when Chicago started doing this about 25 years ago, uh, people would come from all over the world. City planners would come from all over the world to see how they did it. And it has transformed the city. So plants, the power of plants is something we don't talk enough about in the industry. We, uh, we know it, we assume that uh, other people know it, but we need to talk about it. We need to get up on the rooftops and shout this. Plants have a huge power. Plants are very powerful. And the power of plants is something that uh, I just can't, can't quit talking about because it's true. <laughs> and their plants are fantastic and can do all these things. Um, both for cities and and for um, for individuals. So just a last plug for See Your Future, which of course Susan was very involved in. We're really, uh, we've got our Green Career Week next week. Please, if you haven't, go on the website, seedyourfuture.org and check it out. We're trying to get more people to get involved with um, as a career in horticulture because there's so many different careers and we're looking for people. Oh, we certainly are. And just one more thing, I was asked to uh, mention sustainability. So I thought I'd uh, talk about sustainability. My daughter's working on sustainability in our company. And what we decided to do since we're an armada in our company and we're not centralized. So we have three 
centralized Armada goals. And then each of our locations around the world comes up with their own goals, depending on where they are. It might have something to do with, they might be in a drought area and have something to do with water conservation or whatever it is. So the three Armada goals um, I thought I'd share with you. Oh, that's the mission of Seed Your Future, thought, sorry. Um, and they are, these three, um, taken off the UN, uh, from the UN, um, whatever the UN thing is called, I forgot what it's called. And uh, number one is to make sure that all our employees around the world are earning a living wage by 2025. And now we pay our employees very well, um, but the living wage is something very specific. A living wage is, is something that they've tried to figure out for every part in the world, what people need not only to survive, but to uh, be able to save, be able to send their kids to school. So it's, it's much higher than a minimum wage. And we're trying to um, figure out which of our locations uh, are already paying a living wage and which maybe aren't. And we're gonna get up to that by 2025. So this is quite a big uh, commitment. And then we have zero discharge of hazardous pollutants um, in all of our locations worldwide. We hope we're not discharging hazardous pollutants, but um, we have to test this and make sure that we're not. And if we are, we're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to stop it. And then goal three is a 50% reduction in corporate carbon footprint, which just about everybody has as a goal. And then just to close with our uh, seeds of success. So everybody has, all companies have, you know, their corporate, uh, what do you call it? It's sort of a corporate handbook. And I always say, we don't need a corporate handbook. We just need these seeds of success. And there are only five of them and they're very important. And uh, the most important for our employees is the first one, which is never sacrifice the long term for the short term. Because we are a family company and because we um, uh, don't care what the stock market thinks of us because we're not in the stock market, we can think long term. We can do things that maybe are tougher short term, um, but are better for the long term because long term is going to be around a lot longer than the short term. Right? <laughs> and so <clears throat> that's a very important thing that uh, we follow. And then run, the other one that's maybe a little uh, interesting is run to the hard stuff, which is something that we've always done as a company. We always try to do the things that nobody else can do that really need to be done and that are hard to do. And I think those two things go together because sometimes you need a long time to do the hard stuff. So we try to do, to do the hard stuff. So um, that is, uh, that's my um, talk. I went through that super fast, I think. <laughs> Seems like anyway, sorry. Um, and uh, I would love to hear from you, not only just on the chat or whatever, but also there's my, uh, my um, email if you, if you wanna email me. And of course, we would love to have you here at the Gardens of Fall.